Hey, welcome to Audio Punch. Chris Henry here. And if you have not yet downloaded the GarageBand template that you get by filling out the form at the site linked in the description below, you should go do that now because this video is all about how to use the GarageBand template I made for Audio Punch. Uh, okay, so why do you want to use a template? I mean, mainly for me, I don't like to do repetitive tasks. I'm, <laughs> I guess, lazy, but like in a forward moving, uh, iterative sort of way. I, I don't like to do things over and over again if I don't have to do them over and over again. That's why templates are great. Uh, that's why systems are great. What a template does is it's a way for you to just store all of the decisions you're going to make every single time you make an episode, right? If you have a show that's always you and a co-host and a guest, and you always have the same music at the beginning and the same music at the end, maybe you have the same intro at the beginning. You can get all of those things ready, store it in a template, and then when you're ready to edit a new episode or record a new episode, you just open that template. You don't have to make the new tracks, put the effects on it, every single time loading new presets or trying to remember what you did before, right? You can just make all the decisions once and then you have that template. And then what I do typically is over time as the decisions change, you know, we get new equipment, a new recording environment, something changes that I find myself tweaking the template the same way every time I open it, time for a new template, you know? So it removes some of the tedium from uh, what I find to be an otherwise enjoyable task of setting up a session and bringing in the audio and starting an edit. That's what we have here with GarageBand is just a, a simple basic template with some preset effects for you to use to hopefully get you on a path towards finding your own version of the template. Okay, when you first launch GarageBand and you get ready to open a new project, this window right up here is the first thing that pops up. It's got GarageBand's built-in templates there for you to select. They do have actually a voice template that you can choose, but it's not really ideal for creating, editing, or recording a podcast because actually over the years, GarageBand has become less and less useful for making podcasts as they've steered it to be way more of like a make your own music kind of app. Still, it's free, it's an audio editor, and as far as free options go, it's going to blow Audacity out of the water in most respects for making a podcast on a Mac. So. This is where we start. Now, in order to load up the audio punch template, you can do one of two things. Um, the easy way is just to keep a copy of the template package, the template session, somewhere where you can just duplicate it and rename it every time you make a new episode, whether you're recording in it or editing in it, or you can actually make it show up in this screen right here, which I'm going to show you how to do right now. So open up a window in the finder, navigate to your applications folder, find GarageBand, and we're gonna do something that's gonna feel a little maybe scary if you're not used to mucking about inside applications, but don't worry, it's completely safe. The first thing you'll do is right click on GarageBand and go to show package contents. If you don't have a two button mouse, it's just a command click or a two finger click on a laptop. You will navigate to project templates, new project, and into this folder, you will drag the audio punch template. And there it is. Now you can close this window, open GarageBand back up. And now if you scroll down, you can see there's no icon here, which is a bit outside my ability to do. And it's also a little bit, it would be cool, but it's useless. So we're not actually gonna find it. But if you click this empty space, it'll select the audio punch podcast template. You can select choose. And we've got our audio punch session loaded right up. Now I have some audio files preloaded, uh, which you won't see, but you can also see if you do make your own templates this way, if you save your own templates, you can actually keep like your theme music in there or sound effects you always use. You can have them preloaded and it will copy those effects or files over when you select the template to create a new project. So here we are, this is the template and there's basically not a lot going on, but also kind of a lot going on. It depends on your perspective. Now, GarageBand doesn't have a whole lot in the way of 
abilities to sum tracks together, group them into folders, apply effects to the whole thing, that sort of thing, which is something I like to do in templates. It just makes them a little cleaner, a little easier. On the other hand, it's pretty easy to use, <laughs> even still. Um, so real quick then, let's just you know go over what I've got here. You've got uh, some pre-prep tracks for you. Uh, and a track for your in and out voiceover, you know, introdu uh, introduce the episode, talk about any sponsors you might have, upcoming events, that sort of thing, in and out music, and then two tracks, one for the host, one for the guest, and one for any other music you have in your episode. Now, any single one of these, if you just highlight and select Command D to duplicate it, it'll duplicate all of the settings. So if you're going to record four people or bring in four audio tracks from an episode recording session you did on a, another device or something, you can do that. Just duplicate the tracks and then drag and drop your files to import them into the session. The reason I have in and out VO and music separated out from the actual podcast content is really just for organization. The settings, the base settings are about the same, but I find that often you're recording the intro and outro stuff after you've recorded the episode. So you're going to maybe process it just a little bit differently. And also I like to keep my intro and outro stuff kind of above everything else. So I can see when I'm looking at the, uh, audio just for the session, I know I'm just looking at, you know, okay, so the stuff on these tracks is the audio re we recorded for the episode. The stuff on the top two tracks is the audio I recorded after the fact, getting it ready to finally, you know, bounce down and put out into the world. So that's the reason for these tracks. Now, we can get in a little bit to the controls. So when you import audio, the first thing I like to do, first of all, I just have a little segment of a, a Crit Squad bonus episode that we recorded a few months ago loaded in here. I like to leave a good minute or so, maybe two minutes of space. It doesn't have to be exact at the beginning because really most intro and outro stuff you can get into uh, in and out of inside a minute uh, or two. That's that's the target I shoot for anyway. So I like to leave that there just to make editing easier. Now, typically in a lot of other audio workstations like Reaper or Logic or Pro Tools, or I mean, there's there's a million, but uh, the, those are the ones that I'm most intimately familiar with. You can group tracks together and you can do ripple editing and GarageBand really doesn't have that. So that's one caveat when you're making a podcast and GarageBand is uh, editing can be a little more tedious. But at the end of the day, again, it's free and it's better than Audacity for this. So I'm going to show you here the effects we have on each track. Now, each track has an EQ followed by a simple gain plugin followed by a compressor. Now, the reason for the gain plugin is to bring your audio up into the compressor. So if you find you've imported your audio and it's a little too quiet, rather than asking you to fiddle around with the compressor or doing something as, uh, as broad stroke as simply turning up the track volume, what you can do is open up this gain plugin and adjust the gain here. Now I happen to know this audio is, is good, but I, let me show you what it does. Strange like that, but it's, mm -hmm. you're handling everything differently and it's, sure. it feels much more like you're doing an improv sketch and it also gives me time. It... So you can see it pushed audio, it pushed the volume and the loudness up but it was pushing it into the compressor. So it gives you a little bit of wiggle room. You're safe from too many peaks and stuff because of how the compressor is set. And also there's uh, some extra stuff going on on the, the master at the end that we'll talk about. Um, but it's just general good practice rather than turning the volume up and down at the end after everything uh, in order to make you know initial adjustments. What you want is to have a, a good volume to start with and then you can edit the volume with automation later on. So that's how if you bring in your audio tracks, they're a little too quiet. That's how to fix that. The next thing we have in line is the compressor. You pretty much don't have to touch it. 
Um, if you're not getting the audio results you like by boosting the gain, find a spot where the boosting the gain sounds good, and then you can click on the compressor, open up this window here, and just adjust the output gain of the compressor with this window. Uh, typically, if you've recorded at a, a nice decent volume where you're not peaking, but you're also not too quiet, you might not have to mess with that at all, but it's there in case you want it. Next, in in line, actually first in line, is the EQ. I have this first in line for a couple of reasons that are an entirely different video, but uh, here's your basic EQ curve. If you click that little plug in there, uh, you'll see the EQ that I have set up sort of by default. You can edit this, you should edit this. There are five things in play here, but really only three of them do you have to touch all that often, and really only two of those are gonna do the main uh, main EQing for you. So if you hover over, you'll see we've got red, yellow, green, whoops, we'll turn that one off. We've got red, yellow, green, blue, and purple. So red and purple, you really don't have to touch, especially red. Red is here just to get out things like rumble and, and some low level background noises that tend to crop up in recordings, mic handling, stuff like that. It won't cut it out, but it, it turns it down. Green here, this is the sometimes one that you're touching. If, if you find that your audio is sounding a little boxy or cheap, here's how you use this one. You're, you're going to loop some audio which I'm going to solo first by clicking these head, the headphone icon here. We're going to zoom in. I'm going to click and drag up here to get a looped section, and we'll hit play. Now, when you hit play, it's going to loop between the beginning and end of that yellow bar, and then we're going to actually boost this all the way up by clicking on it and then hovering over the gain here and moving it all the way up to the top. This is not a final product, but then while the audio is playing, we will hover over the frequency and move it up and down in this range from like 300 to 700 hertz. Somewhere in that range, if your audio is sounding cheap and kind of gross, there's going to be a like a resonant tone. It's gonna sound like you're talking into a, a, a cardboard paper tube or something. Uh, you'll hear what I mean when we play through it, but basically by boosting the EQ gain as high as it can go in a narrow fashion, and then hunting around, you can find the problem spots, the parts of the sound that maybe your ear isn't sensitive to pick up when they're in amongst all the other sounds, but you boost up a, a tiny portion of the frequency and you can kind of find those offending frequencies. So this one is a sometimes one if you don't, if your audio doesn't sound like boxy or, uh, or kind of nasally, you don't have to touch this. I have it set to a common frequency that I find tends to be boxy on pretty much most microphones. It has more to do with the room than the mic itself. So we're just gonna do that real quick. It allows me as the GM to set up situations like when you guys were in the shipping container, right. where it's just, this is just character interaction. There's no real point to the scene other than get to know the new guy. It allows me as the GM to set up situations like when you guys were in the shipping container, you hear that ringing quality to that? Let's listen again. It allows me as the GM to set up situations like when you guys were in the shipping container right. where it's just, this is just character interaction. There's no... That's called resonance. Uh, it can come from inside the speaker's head. It can come from within the electronics of the microphone. It can come from the shape of the room you're in. It's, it's really hard to predict and... Uh, plan for. So if you are getting a little bit of resonance, if there's something that's just not feeling right about the sound of a, a speaker, this is the way you can find that. So I did find like a really ringy thing. It's about 300. The next thing you do is you just bring that down like nine decibels, which is a big EQ cut. But now listen. It allows me as the GM to set up situations like when you guys were in the shipping container right. where it's just, this is just character interaction. There's no real point to the scene other than get to know the new guy. It allows me as the GM. So if you listen back to that section right there, you can hear that when the EQ is off, the voice sounds fine. But then when you turn it on, having found and cut that frequency, it just sounds a little cleaner. 
So that's a, a trick you can do to, to up the production quality if you're recording in a subpar environment like most of us do, or if there's just a quality about the speaker interacting with the microphone that you know didn't sit right with you. So after that, the next thing we have here is yellow. Yellow, uh, I have set to around 140 hertz, which is pretty low. That's gonna be like the beefy quality of people's voices. Um, if you have people who aren't trained speakers, or just have naturally just sort of a, a thinner voice. They, they're not doing anything wrong, but typically what I found is trained speakers or singers, people who are used to using their voice as an instrument, their voice tends to come from their chest, right? Like I just did there. That's not my natural speaking voice. I, I tend to speak from throat and sinuses. And as a result, sometimes uh, my voice doesn't sound quite as you know chunky as I would like it to. It doesn't fill your ears and give you that intimate sort of um, high quality podcast sound. So if you find that uh, that feeling is lacking from your recording, one thing you can try is boosting this just a little bit. I'm leaving it boosted by default in the template because a couple of dB in that range usually sounds pretty good. But if you find that uh, your tracks are sounding a little too boomy, you can come in and pull this down either by clicking on the dot and dragging it or clicking on the dot and then coming over here and dragging, which is a little more precise. But um, you can you can cut it, you can boost it to your heart's content. I recommend not going too much past four decibels in either direction just to stay safe. It's easy to overdo this sort of thing, especially when you're just starting to get used to EQ. So number four, uh, which is the other sort of, you're gonna come in and use this pretty frequently thing is the blue here. The blue I have at a range where, uh, especially cheaper microphones tend to be a little boosted. This is the presence range. It's what makes your voice kind of cut through. It's where a lot of the consonant sounds live when you're speaking. So intelligibility can sometimes live here too. If you cut this too much, it'll be really, it, it sounds like you're listening to someone who's underwater. So. Don't cut it too much. But again, I have this cut just a little bit because it compensates for uh, what most cheaper microphones or even nicer microphones in a subpar room can sound a little bit more present. Also, again, some speakers' voices, mine, I have a sort of default high presence to my speaking voice. And so I tend to cut that just a little bit to kind of smooth things out. Last here, you don't really need to touch this, is just a little bit of high end. It's it's really high. It's almost outside the standard range of healing hearing, but it's cut just a little bit. And this is to combat hiss. Just a little bit to take the edge off of that hiss that's probably going to be present off of cheaper preamps or cheaper microphones or uh, that sort of thing, that high level sort of white noisy kind of sound. Uh, it just takes the edge off. Also, when we're doing digital recording and digital processing, things tend to sound a little harsh. This is a way to bring that back down. You can, uh, you can turn it on and off by clicking this here and see which one you prefer. I think uh, it sounds better if we take that down just a little bit. So those are the the five EQ bands that we have in play here. But again, yellow for bass and beefiness, blue, aqua, I guess, for presence or um, toning down harshness, and then green here for surgically cutting down uh, undesirable resonances in the voices. Again, green, you can ignore if you want. Red, you can ignore. Purple, you can ignore. But yellow to make people sound beefier. Green, aqua marine, turquoise, this one, to either boost presence, make people sound a little more uh, forward, or if people sound harsh, you can cut it in order to temper some of that harshness. So that's where we live there. And uh, last thing I'm going to do here is just I'm going to loop through this audio again, and I'm going to bypass the EQ entirely just so you can hear the difference. It's a subtle difference, but I think it's it's meaningful, especially when you think about, you know, someone's going to be listening to an hour of this at a time. You want to do a little bit of work to make sure that it doesn't get fatiguing, you know. 
So here we go. Let's listen to this real quick. It allows me as the GM to set up situations like when you guys were in the shipping container right. where it's just, this is just character interaction. There's no real point to the scene other than get to know the new guy. It allows me as the GM to set up situations like when you guys were in the shipping container right. where it's just, this is just character interaction. There's no real point to the scene. So you can see we haven't changed the overall timbre or feel of Austin's voice there, but it sounds just a little bit more uh, present, a little more solid, subtle changes, but they're changes that I find to be pretty meaningful. Again, don't overdo it. If in doubt, leave it alone. As long as it sounds good, you're fine. But if you are hearing something that uh, you would like to address, the EQ is where you can do that. So... When it comes to GarageBand, uh, that's basically that's basically it. There is one more control here you'll notice, which is the noise gate. You can access by clicking on the plugin or by clicking this checkbox here and using this slider. They're the exact same controls. The only difference is on this one up here uh, that you get by opening the plugin. You can actually see the numbers without having to hover over the dial. These numbers only show up while you're while you're dragging. I don't know why. Uh, so that's that's what that is. Now, I have this off for one major reason. It's only control is threshold. Normally, noise gates allow you to edit how quickly they start activating, how quickly or slowly they stop activating. A lot of them have a control for once activated, how long do I stay open? getting ahead of myself a little bit of noise gate, basically you set a threshold and if the audio signal that's going into the gate is lower than that threshold, it's silent. So another way to think about it is, here's your threshold, you must be this loud to pass. Anything louder than that will get through. One of the things you can use that for in a podcast scenario is uh, noise, dealing with background noise or bleed. It can work, but because it doesn't have all those other controls, what I find is that in GarageBand, for the most part, it, it frequently sound, does more harm than good. But I'm going to show you a trick that you can use. If you do have a lot of noise, which I do, because we recorded this sort of impromptu, and so the air conditioning was on and all this other stuff, uh, listen to how much noise there is just in this uh, one say small section. That's, that's a lot of hiss. It's pretty loud, especially considering uh, it's loud relative to the voice. So let's listen to some speaking followed by the silence. The turn-based grid. You know, that's it's loud. It's really loud. Uh, and it's loud for two reasons. One, the noise was loud in the room. And two, there's noise in both of these tracks. So when you stack them together, it gets loud. Um, normally, what I would do if I had a decent built-in noise gate, I would set that up for you, but there isn't one. You can probably find a free noise gate. It's not a complicated, uh, compared to other kinds of digital signal processing, it's fairly straightforward. But uh, GarageBand doesn't have one. So we're stuck with what they have for this template. Okay, so let's solo this track. I've got a, a little section here selected that we're gonna loop through, and I'm gonna show you what I mean. The turn-based grid. Yeah. I'm actually, it's, it's been through playing D and D that I've started to like that kind of thing more. The turn. So if you listen to that section, what you're hearing is lots of noise, no noise, lots of noise, no noise. And it's a very harsh cutoff. Now imagine if I was stuttering a little bit during a thought, which happens all the time in conversations, what the noise gate is going to do is it, it's going to, it's going to sound like it's flapping. It, it, it'll be very jarring to hear over a long period of time because the listener will never know when the noise is going to come back, when it's going to be gone. And the fact that also you can't feed in a little bit of the original signal so that there's a little bit of noise. It's just not great, which is unfortunate because one of the other things that makes GarageBand less useful for podcasting than it used to be is a few versions ago, which is actually the version I was most familiar with and the, the reason initially why I recommended GarageBand, aside from the fact that it's free, is it had a, 
uh, a denoising filter in it. They took it away. It's gone. It wasn't great, but it worked. It's gone now. They they took it away because if you're an Apple user, you will use what they give you and you will like it, God damn it. I still love Mac OS. I grew up on Mac OS. It is in my fingers and my soul. I will never be as fast on Windows as I am in Mac OS. But this shit really, really peeves me because they took away a tool that they didn't need to take away. Plugins are not big. They took it away, I have to imagine, to restrict GarageBand further to a single thing. I don't, I don't know whose design vision it was to remove that functionality, but... We are enemies. In any case, it's not available to you. You can pick up um, Isotope RX Elements. It's frequently on sale for anywhere from 30 to 50 bucks. By default, it's, I think, 130 bucks. But that has a brilliant denoising filter. If, if you really want to save yourself a bunch of time and up your production quality, Isotope, uh, Isotope RX is something else. We'll link to it in the description below. Uh, at least try a demo to see what the dialogue denoiser does. Oof. It's, it's impressive, but we don't have that. What we have is a noise gate. So one thing I would definitely not do in this situation is activate the noise gate on both tracks because just listen to what happens a little bit. I, I want you to pay attention to any sort of flapping or fluttering, especially between the two tracks. So I'm going to come up to Austin's here. We're going to set his noise gate real quick. I'll fast forward through that for you. Okay, so I have Austin set up now, and uh, we're just going to listen to both of these together. Let me find uh, a, a little bit of a band to resection. No, what? You know, no. Let's just listen to these together real quick. Whereas for like the, the Shadow Run video games. I really enjoy that style of gameplay. Sure. The turn-based grid. You hear that? Listen to that. It just There's a section where my breath got past the noise gate, but not all the way, so there's just this random blip of sound. Let's listen to that again. Gameplay. Sure. The turn-based grid. If you're listening to this on a laptop speakers or on your phone or anything really other than headphones, you might not have heard that, but when do you listen to podcasts? Headphones. Maybe in your car, but... Most of the time it's it's on headphones, right? So for that reason, I, I can't really recommend the noise gate for GarageBand, but I do have it there. It's there by default. There is a way you can mitigate some of this noise. Now, of these two tracks, I happen to know from listening before that my track here uh, is way noisier than Austin's track. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn the noise gate on only for my track. So what's going to happen as a result of that, there's always going to be a little bit of noise, which is fine. Uh, digital silence is really jarring, and, and it's not going to exist on something that you recorded with a microphone. There's going to be some background noise. When you're denoising or trying to get rid of it, the object is not to uh, uh, eliminate all background noise. What you're really doing is reducing the level of the background noise so it's not distractingly part of the spoken word, part of what you're actually here to listen to. So what we have here is the noise from Austin's track will always be there, which will help to mask when the denoiser, or sorry, the noise gate is activating and deactivating on my track. So let's listen back to that real quick. Yeah. Three squares, four, like the, the Shadowrun video games. I really enjoy that style of gameplay. Sure. The turn-based grid. So let's listen to that again. I really enjoy that style of gameplay. Sure. The turn-based grid. Yeah. I mean, actually, it's it's been... So you can hear it. It's still there, but it's, it is nowhere near as jarring. So if you find that the noise is really bugging you, like it is me in this, in this instance, that's one thing you might want to try. Still, be really careful because this noise gate is so harsh, it, it can swallow the ends of your sentences if you're not careful. And uh, uh, among other things, you know, the flapping, the fluttering and stuff, it's not ideal. And I'm, I'm really upset to learn that they took away the denoising filter. Um, but that's the world we live in. And again, there's so much other stuff going for you here. The fact that it's free, it's got a lot of editing 
capabilities that uh, a free software like Audacity doesn't have. And in fact, actually, you could download Audacity, it's also free, use Audacity's denoising feature on just your raw recorded audio, and then bring it into GarageBand for editing. That's a trick you could do. In fact, I'll probably do a video about that at some point. So that is basically the end of the, the template overview. A uh, couple of things I'm gonna show you for finishing real quick, but basically that's all there is. I do have a compressor and a limiter on the master track, but you shouldn't ever really have to touch those. If you do need to, just click over here to master on the info panel and you can edit the compressor. It's, it's nothing special. Uh, these here are designed to just further bring the audio up to program level, which there's no uh, complicated metering here, but if you're seeing it uh, kind of peaking around here, that's gonna be good to go. So that's basically it. The, the last thing that I wanna show you is what to do about music and ducking. If you're not familiar with ducking, that is when you set a compressor to act on one signal as a result of information it gets from another signal. So when you use a compressor for ducking, what you're doing is you put the compressor on a music track and you tell it to listen to a vocal track. And anytime the vocal track triggers the compressor, rather than turning the vocal track down like a compressor would normally do, it's gonna turn the music down instead. The net effect is when you're talking, the music gets quieter. Really handy tool, used to be part of GarageBand, also no longer part of GarageBand. <laughs> um, I, I don't know why. I don't know why, again, a, co a totally useful tool. They used to have a podcast template in GarageBand. It's gone. Maybe it's somewhere else. Maybe maybe all of all of this is is useless. Uh, and there's another app that they released that'll let you do it, which, okay, fine. But I don't think so. I think they just took it away. I think it's just not in this software. And that's a shame because it's so useful. You can't, you can't use it. There is automation though, which is just, well, it's not just as easy because it's not set and forget, but it's not much harder. So let's bring in some music real quick. So I have here some, uh, some blues music I got from Audio Blocks, which is where I get all of my stuff actually. Uh, it's not free, but as far as royalty free stuff goes, it's not the worst option. Uh, so anyway, let's say this is our intro here. Let's, let's pull, let's pull this down to where just one person's talking just for the sake of simplicity. Now, if we play this, you're going to hear that, uh, the music sounds just fine. But then when, uh, when I start talking it, all of a sudden I, the voice is competing with the music and you can't hear what's going on. So listen to this real quick. Whoops. I don't know about about you, but like I imagine as a GM, like it, it must be. Is it, is it what I think it is? Because I think that having a game where all of your characters are like, nope, we're going to do the entire thing in world, in character. It's Okay, it's not ideal, right? So uh, what you can do is in GarageBand, you can hit the A key to open up automation. See, I've actually got some here left from uh, when I was playing around with this before which is good because uh, you don't want that in your template. I'm gonna get rid of it. You can get rid of automation points by double clicking on them. So uh, here we go. I have some automation and what I want to do, I'm gonna zoom in. What I want to do is have this music turn down a little bit when the voices come in. So you add one point, that's your anchor. And you add another point just a little bit after, but not too close, otherwise it'll sound jarring a little bit after the speaker starts. Now, if you do it right, it actually won't sound too much like the, the music got turned down. So I like to put my first automation point just after the person starts talking. And then my second one, maybe, I don't know, how far is this? Like half a second later, maybe a full second later. 
and you can pull it down pretty significantly. Now listen. It seems like it's about, about you, but like I imagine as a GM, like it, it must be. The music definitely turned down, but it, it's subtle. It's not terribly jarring because what's happening is there's new information coming on and you you automatically focus on that and you stop focusing on the level of the music. So that's how automation can work for this. Now, you'll pull this point around to sort of massage uh, how loud you want it to be. If you are going to have music under, say, an intro or under a whole conversation, I've done that before just to experiment with it. Uh, it can work for shorter conversations or or if you're doing like a reportage, uh, a journalistic style where, you know, you're cutting from one little story to another little story to another little story. Each one can have a different music bed to help differentiate them, that sort of thing. This is how you'll adjust going from, you know, when you play the music to introduce the show or introduce the new scene or the new segment to when people start talking over it. You want the music to at least fade out. But you also might want to do one of these harsh ducks first. Harsh is the wrong word. One of these quicker ducks first, and then a slower fade like this. So we'll add another point way far away. And really what this is doing, if you're unfamiliar with automation, is it's uh, attached to volume by default. You can actually automate panning. You can automate effects parameters uh, in a lot of DAWs. I don't know if you can do that in GarageBand, bit beyond the scope of this video. But what it's saying is, okay, we're going to start at this volume, and then here, we're going to go from this volume to this volume over this span of time. Same thing, we're going to go from this volume to this volume over this span of time. It's basically like programming someone, you know, programming a robot to turn the volume up and down over time. So now let's, let's listen to this section. I don't know about, about you, but like I imagine as a GM, like it, it must be is it what I think it is? Because I think that having a game where all of... So you can see that that's a way that you can bring the music in, use it at a, a nice program volume, and and get it ducked in the absence of an automatic ducker that GarageBand doesn't have because... Anyway. So that's the solution to ducking. Just use automation. If you do it right, you know, unless unless you really want to get crazy with it where the music comes back in during longer pauses and stuff, it's really quite simple. And even then, that's an artful decision you can make in the moment and just hit A, go back into automation, make your edits, and you're done. So that is... That's the GarageBand template. I wish there was a little bit more of the functionality that it used to have. I could have done a lot more helpful things, but the compressor setup, the EQ setup, that should still save you a little bit of time. And if you find yourself making the same tweaks over and over and over again, take one of, the, of your sessions, delete all the audio from it, except the stuff you use every episode, save it, name of your show template and put it into your templates folder just like you did with the audio punch one at the beginning and you can access your your version of the template over time and save yourself a bunch of time remove some of the tedium from an otherwise typically enjoyable task and uh, make your shows a little bit easier to make hope you find it useful don't forget to make your own version of the template as you learn things as you go along this is just a starting point but i hope it uh, helps give you a sense of things you can do, some basic processing to help, you know, elevate the sound of your podcast. We'll see you next time.